there at the Portland Media Center meeting the candidates for Portland mayor as part of the Civic IQ project. And I'm here with Pius Ali. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Greg. Um, can you tell me a little about your background, um, uh, your history? Tell so anything you, you want, you know, you want us to know. <laughs> So my name is Pius Ali, as you said it. I am an immigrant from Ghana. I came to the U.S. in 2000. I landed in New York, lived in New York for two years, and then I came to visit Portland in 2002, and I fell in love with Portland. I went to New York, gather my uh, stuff, and move in here. Interesting enough, the friend who I came to visit used to be a student in this building at the main College of Art. Uh, his name is Ebenezer Akako, uh, and so that is how I ended up in Portland. When I came to Portland, I've had jobs in many different uh, uh, places. I've worked in restaurants, uh, and then I accidentally, and I use the word accidentally because uh, the direction that I could have never been uh, what I wanted to do. Um, um, I found a job with an organization called PROP, People Regional Opportunity Program. Um, so very simple job. I was to work with uh, uh, high school, middle school kids when they get out of school, I get them busy so that they don't get in trouble mm -hmm. and uh the locations for that job was at kennedy park riveton park sagamore village and front street and that job was what set me up to where i am today uh, i got to learn the community i got to learn uh, a lot about this country uh, uh, because the people that live in those neighborhoods are immigrants uh poor white folks uh and uh, uh what they have in common is poverty and the challenges that they face got me to start thinking and asking. I became uh, like uh, an advocate for a lot of the kids because their parents don't even know. It doesn't matter whether they are immigrants or not. They don't even know how to engage the education system. So I got parents to sign a waiver that says that if their child is in trouble, I am, or if the schools want to talk to them, I am allowed to represent those parents. I did that for a um, couple of years. I had a job with uh, uh, Oxford Street Shelter uh, working as an overnight shelter staff, got a job with Preble Street uh, at a teen shelter, um, started my own nonprofit called Maine Interfaith Youth Alliance because of what I see happening uh, with a lot of young people who are coming from different backgrounds. Ran that for some time and didn't have the money out of pocket to run it, so I let it go. I co-started another youth program with the now speaker, uh, Talbot Ross, called King Fellows. Uh, it was an ideology of building leadership amongst uh, young people of color based on the uh, principles of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, I went on to work for Seas of Peace. Uh, I currently serve on the board of directors of Seas of Peace at the, at the international level. I'm a board member. I've been on the board, I think, two or two and a half years ago. Um, I work with an organization called uh, Volunteers of America, Northern New England. Uh, they have a halfway house uh, or transitional house in Brackett Street. I worked there for several years before um, I was invited to start a program that will get uh, immigrants and other uh, minorities and then poor wild uh, uh, folks to engage the education system in Portland. Um, I started it um, at the city, city of Portland's Refugee Services, eventually moved it to Maskey School. It is called Portland Empowered. It is currently housed at uh, Maine Immigrant Rights Coalition. Basically what we do is uh, we create opportunities for parents who are immigrants currently. Before it was parents who are not engaged, but now it's evolved into immigrant parents to understand the way the education system works, to have a sense of community, of belonging. Uh, uh, that is the parents. The students, it's to build their leadership skills. And two years ago, we added another component, which is a leadership program called Civic and Community Engagement Fellowship. What that does is uh, it works with uh, young immigrants between the age, I call them loosely young because I know most of them since they were teenagers, uh, uh, between the age of 20 and 30, uh, uh, to learn how to network, how to find a job and keep it. Uh, and based on what they are interested in, we invite people who are coming from similar background to come and have a conversation with them. Um, um, so uh, that is what I have done over the years. I should have uh, mentioned that you're also a city councilor and uh, a former school board member. Yes. yes. When I started, the, the, uh, I've been volunteering in the schools for a long time. And then when I got to, uh, uh, when I started that organization, which worked with education, 
I got connected to other organiz similar organizations across the country, and I got to learn some of the challenges in education that I was not seeing because I go in as a volunteer. So that brought me to run for school board in 2013. And then three years later, uh, there was an opening on the city council seat and I ran for it. And I've been on the council for seven years. I am currently the longest serving city councillor. Mm -hmm. I've been on the council for 70 years. Uh, the closest is the mayor, which is four, she's been on four years. Anyone else is three years, two years and one year. I am the mayor pro tem, which means that if the mayor cannot uh, officiate meetings or she cannot attend any public event, she asks me to. I joke to people that I'm the part time mayor or the shadow mayor. <laughs> um, Vice mayor. On my, yeah, uh, on my civic uh, responsibilities or engagement or participation outside elected office, I serve on the Metro board. I also serve on uh, uh, the board of Prosper, I say Prosperity, on the board of, uh, uh, there's an, a non-profit that is owned by GP Cog, or that was started by GP Cog, Cog Center for Regional Prosperity. I serve on that board. I uh, uh, am a founding board member of a program called um, Your Neighbor Books. What we do is we find books that share different immigrant narratives, and then we share it with schools. Uh, we started here in Portland. Now we are all over the state and all over the country. Uh, we actually have some books uh, in Canada, uh, in some schools in Canada, one or yeah. two that have reached out to us. Uh, what else do I am I involved in? Um, yeah. Well, I, that sounds uh, like a pretty full plate. I, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, I it, also say for that. Uh, yeah. 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 Public service. Yeah. yeah. Um, take me back to 2002 uh, when you first saw Portland, what, what was it about the city that you found attractive? What, what was it like? Uh, that what, what was that experience like for you? Uh, for an immigrant who is coming from Ghana, uh, New York was a little bit too fast for me. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that uh, when I first arrived in New York, I raised my hand and looked at the skyscrapers and I was like, uh, what did I got myself into? <laughs> um, so when I came here, um, as I have said before we started having this conversation, I was a photojournalist. So I got attracted to the artistic nature of Portland. Um, when I came to New York, there is, I wasn't working then. Uh, there was a photo studio called B and it's a photo shop called B and H. Spent a lot of time there. I will go to B and H and in B and H, I found, I think as uh, there is a photo project. It's like a, a training center somewhere in Waterville or somewhere in May. I found the name. I'm like, oh my goodness. That was the first time I saw the name May. Uh -huh. And I don't know that as a place called May. So when I came to Portland, walk around, uh, my friend used to work, he, uh, go to school here and he worked at a restaurant. Um, for the first time, I went into a coffee shop that also served as uh, like a community space. So he would send me there and then he would go to work. Uh -huh. um, I forgot what it was called, but it was at the top of where the most music used to be. It was like a small space. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, it was a coffee shop. And um, uh, when you go in, there's newspapers, there are books, there are people just sitting down and talking that and the sense of community the sense of uh, uh the small town where you get to if you walk up the street a couple of times you'll see the same faces you'll say hi to people and people talk to you people were more friendly mm -hmm. i realized that at that point in new york i was just a number but here i was someone that uh, 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 uh that could engage that could get involved that can connect to the community that mm -hmm. he lives in you think the city has changed since the last 21 years absolutely i was Having a conversation with someone uh, when I was conversing yesterday, uh, and the person said to me, Pius, I've lived here all my life, and this city is changing drastically. And I said to him that I've been here for only 21 years. Actually, I'm not fully 21 years yet until, actually 21 years is this year. Uh -huh. uh, and I said to him that, uh, and I've seen the city change. Uh, sometimes you don't see the change because you are theoretically part of it, you, you, you see a, a foundation being built, you see something being put in place. And then when you pay close attention, you go like, when did this thing got uh -huh. to be here? <laughs> it's been here. You've been seeing it every day. And then, um, uh, the people, the, the diversity, the, the restaurants, almost everything about, uh, when people ask me, I say that when I came to Portland, it was a city that had been in a very deep sleep and it was waking up. And now Portland is fully awake uh -huh. and walking. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want you to sort of look ahead. Uh, imagine 10 years from now, what do you see? How do you see the city um, is different? What's your vision for the city? And, and what, what should we be doing now to achieve that? 
equation. I think we need to take a step back from where we are now and look at, uh, 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 I don't remember word by word what our uh, comprehensive plan says. It says something like we are going to be a city that is welcoming to everybody. We're going to be a city that will meet the need of all our residents. And we are going to be a city that will create a thriving environment for business. So what we need to do is take a step back and ask ourselves, are we that city? If we are not, what are we going to do to get there? Mm -hmm. If we are able to answer these questions and put something on paper, I think 10 years from now, we'll be the perfect city and the wonderful city that Portland is supposed to be. And Portland have the capacity and the ability to do that. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of controversy about the, the, the nature of the job of mayor. Uh, we didn't used to have one. Then we had one and people are dissatisfied with, with um, the way the job is constructed. And we had a, a charter commission and, and proposed changes that the voters turned down. And right. so here we are. And I guess as somebody who is running for mayor, what is your sense of what, what is the job of mayor in Portland and, and um, how does the mayor influence events in our, in our system? Yep, I think the mayor, uh, the current mayor as is structured, uh, uh, have a lot of limitations uh, and also opportunities. Uh, the mayor, in my uh, 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 in my sense, uh, is like uh, so. I'm going to take a step from the mayor, move away from the mayor, and look at the city in its entity and the city government, the council. I see the city as a true legged stool, right? I'm sorry, so what? Three legged stool. stool. Yeah. One is uh, the council. One is the city staff, and the other one is the public. And as the mayor of Portland, you should be able and have the ability uh, to engage all th these three components. How are you going to do that? Depends on how you look at it. It's not, it's the political phase, but it's also supposed to be a convener and somebody who build consensus based on what it is in the charter. I think uh, I am thinking out aloud the other day that uh, because of this mayoral race, people are asking for Let's have forum here, let's have debate. And I said, do people even know the limitations of this office that they're asking people? If they are gonna have a civic conversation like this, that is great. But if it's a policy, uh, how do we call it, debate, where each of us will say, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. Well, you can list all aspirations that you want. They are aspirations. You should be able to work with a city manager and your eight colleagues to be able to move anything forward. Even if it is to put a stop sign in the corner of a street at the, at, at the neighborhood. If the people in the neighborhood say, we don't want this stop sign, right. Right. they're going to get some of your colleagues to say that, well, the neighbor said you don't want it. Why do you want it there, right? Uh -huh. and, and you need to have skills in bringing people together, which I think I have a lot of that. I work with Seas of Peace as a facilitator. I think I'm good enough for them to put me on the board of directors. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the, the, the role of the mayor as a convener, a, a, a consolidator of a, 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 a opinion, a, what you put it? Yes, a convener and uh, someone that will be able to facilitate the, 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 the council, build a good relationship with each councillor, be able to bring forward a conversation when there's a contentious issue in the city, be able to be public facing, as well as uh, internally being able to get the council in collaboration with staff uh, as it is now uh, uh, to bring the city to a place where everybody will be uh, will be will be okay. I, there's a saying that I created which says that uh, um, um, uh, this agreement does not make us enemies. It just says that uh, we are partners with a different set of values, and if we agree uh, to give up something in return for something. We will all get somewhere where we'll be okay. We'll not be fully agreeing that this is where we want to be, but it's a good place to start. So whoever is the mayor should be able to do that. Mm -hmm. When there's a, an issue that is uh, contentious, the mayor should be able to listen to both sides and be able to guide the council to some sort of consensus. You will not always get that because uh, councillors are human beings. Uh, there's emotions, there's solid beliefs where someone will say this is a line that I will not cross, that is okay, but you don't fight with them. Mm -hmm. you, you find a way to work with everyone and work with staff and also be the face that will go out in public and say that this is what we did and this is why we did this. 
And this is why it is important because you already have engaged them. Mm -hmm. When I got on the council, I made a recommendation that has so not been fulfilled yet, which was that we do a lot of, uh, uh, a, how do we call it? Uh, we send out emails, we do press releases, but we don't necessarily engage the people that we lead. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 because engagement is a two-way street. We wait until there's an issue and people got angry and they line up in front of us. Um, so I made a suggestion to create an office of uh, uh, citizenship engagement, uh -huh. right? When there's an issue with that office, even before, because sometimes the council sees something coming or city staff sees something coming. If we have a, a, a somebody, whether it is one or two people in that office that have built relationship with the city, they could go out and have, start having conversation before people get angry, before emotions got high. They've already have that conversation. And then when it is ready to be in the front of the council, these individuals or this office may have already uh, 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 set the platform for the council, the manager's office, and the public to have this conversation. So you've uh, been around for three different mayoral uh, right. experiences <laughs> and uh, very different people yeah, uh, different approaches to the job. Is there anything you've seen from the from the three uh, preceding mayors that you would like to emulate? Is there anything that you hope to avoid? Um, what What have you learned from that from the the evolving role of the mayor? Right, uh, one of the mayors. To for the records, I wasn't on the council. Oh, you weren't on the but council. I was on the school board. Right, right. So I observed it from a distance. Yeah. Right. I think uh, 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 what I hope, if I am. Um, lucky and privileged enough for the people of Portland to uh, vote for me to be the mayor. What I hope to be is a, a merge of all three of them. Each of them have a lot of skill, a, a, a strength, and they also have their, their weakness. That is why I give the example of the three stools. Uh, a, a city needs a leader, uh, and that is not the, the role of the city manager. A city needs a, a leader that they see all the time in time of celebration, in time of crisis and in time of anything with no agenda of pushing any policy uh, when they go out to meet the people. Mm -hmm. Just the people to know that this is who my mayor is, right? Because I, I, the, the, the position has limitation. So yeah. all you can do is be a cheerleader, uh -huh. right? You cheer the city when there's celebration, uh, uh, when there's an event uh, organized by whoever you show up, I'm the mayor, I'm here to support you. When a restaurant in Portland gets a, an award from New York Times or somewhere, you write them a letter and say, congratulations, you're making our city look beautiful. Uh, 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 it, and it goes on and on. And also you should be able to have good relationship with your peers who, because you are one vote out of nine. Uh, right. out of, yeah, one out of nine, uh, including you. Uh, it's not that there's a separate office for the office of the mayor, as we have in Westbrook and other part of the state. You are part of the council. I have said this publicly, so I can say it again. The mayor's office is a glorified at large city councilor. Uh -huh. So you should be able to have this, this meeting and this work with your colleagues and be the cheerleader, the face of the council. When there's a, a, a somebody coming to visit, I, I, uh, I have a relationship with the uh, 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 World Affairs Council of Maine. And so they will have people coming to visit Maine, uh, Portland. And I'll say, bring them to City Hall, let's talk to them. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things that the mayor should be doing. Uh -huh. um, I also understand that uh, a mayor's term and tenure uh, can be shaped by nature, by things that they don't have no control over. Pandemic can happen again, right? Uh, George Floyd may happen again. Then you have yeah. crises at hand. Then you also, at that time, it's not celebration time. It's a time that you need to be out there talking to people. And uh, um, yeah, so that is what my mayorship will be. Of course, uh, uh, I will also push for some policies uh, uh, when needed. If the public is coming to me and say, we need to change this, I will talk to my colleagues on the council. I will talk to city staff. I will, uh, because uh, um, each councillor or each person who is in an elected office None of us know everything. Um, uh, it doesn't matter what you know or what your beliefs are. You need to talk to people who are experts um, uh, uh, to shape and frame policy or, um, uh, or process or whatever it is that you are leading on the council. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like one of the uh, limitations that you describe uh, of the mayor's office is that um, be because there are only one vote on the council, um, it, there's not always a sort of a clear voice for city policy 
um, uh, a lot of things happen in the council chamber, but don't necessarily translate um, out to the to the community. And I'm wondering how you deal with that part of it, where you you are just one councilor, but you also have, as you say, you know, uh, people look to the mayor for um, uh, clear you know clarity about what the what the city's about. Yeah. So there is something that I learned even when I was on the school board that uh, uh, if you are part of this body, uh, there are some things that you cannot go out and say uh, because you're not representing yourself anymore. You're presenting the body. You can say it as an individual, but uh -huh. you cannot say the council or that. But only the mayor can do that yeah. or the school board chair. Right. So let's say uh, um, there is a vote about an issue that is very contentious in the yeah. community and then um, uh, the city the council votes on it even if i'm on the uh, uh how do we call it the the, the site that didn't didn't support it i think as the mayor because of what i said on what i believe that you're supposed to be the face of the council it's an obligation on me to go out there and say to the public that last night we have all last week based on how you structure your engagement with the public it will be in the form of an email uh maybe once a week or once a month, uh, knowing that you don't have staff, you have to do a lot of things by yourself. Uh, and also periodically um, um, uh, do an in-person meeting with the public and say that we support, we did this, we did this. It could be a quarterly meeting with the mayor. Um, when I was on the school board, I was able to get the school board to change how we engage. I pushed for the creation of the, of a, uh, I think uh, it's a community, public affairs committee and then while we i pushed for it three years and we did it the year that i was leaving the school board where i said that let's go to communities and talk to people let's leave all the trappings of power that we have because not everybody who lives in this city will be able to come to the school board meetings so we started having community conversation there was no school board are here and everyone else is here we create a round table like a seat around and parents will come and have a conversation with us like the citizens that we are I was able to get the school board to start rotating the school board meetings. Uh, once in a while, they go to a school because parents already believe and have comfortable relationship with that school building. So when you come and meet there for them to see you, to talk to you directly, so we'll do one at a, a Kim Middle School, we'll do one um, at a Reiki Elementary on Pix Island, a different part of the city all year round. We, 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 if we rotated it and uh, of course you cannot do that with the council, but there should be uh, the fall meetings that we have uh, by the council. I wish we can move it to summer mm -hmm. where more people can participate, more people can attend and talk to us. I also know that there is uh, a lot of apathy in, it's not just here, it's all over the country in engaging um, uh, um, a, a political body. We can do things different. Portland is 67,000 people. Uh, um, um, I can walk around Portland um, within a few hours right. uh, on foot, right? So the governing body or the mayor should be able to build that relationship where uh, in the summer, uh, uh, come and have ice cream with the mayor, right? <laughs> For people to get to talk to people. That is the type of mayor that I'm going to be. Okay. Um, so you already are out knocking on doors and you have a pretty good sense of um, where people are. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing the city right now? Housing. And uh, uh, what can we do with our neighbors who are in uh, encampments? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, two, I think, related issues, but but um, pretty much, you know, part of maybe two sides of the same coin. But let's start with um, uh, affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, what are what are things that the city could do to make the make this a more affordable place? All right. I think uh, 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 the lack of housing is uh, a problem in its own, but it's also the byproduct uh, of other things. Um, I, uh, we have housing where uh, my daughter is in college right now in Boston. I'm pretty sure when she gets out of college and she decides not to how do we go to the next level uh, to do master's or something else, she may want to come back home. Do I think she will get a job that will pay her enough for her to afford an apartment in Portland? No. So we need to look at how do we pay people who work here in Portland, especially young people who are just coming out of college uh, and, and immigrants who are getting into their first jobs, even though they have some sort of like skills from back home. That is one. Uh, the other one is uh, 
Portland needs to have a conversation with itself on uh, a, the neighbors that will line up in front of city hall and say that uh, city 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 council in the city chamber, you cannot build here because this is not the way our community looks like. We need to have a, a deep conversation with ourselves and say that, uh, are we going to build a perimeter or put some things in place that says that it doesn't matter what the neighborhood is, you can build this, but this is how you build it in a very sensible way that, uh, uh, would be, that, that can be built. Um, do I have an absolute answer to what we can do for housing? No, because it's a very complicated issue, but I have an idea. Uh, a few years ago, when I was on the housing committee, I'm still, I chair the housing committee. I wasn't the chair then. Uh, Councillor Dusen was the chair and I was on it with Councillor Cook. We asked city staff to look at the lands, every land that the city owns. The then city manager said to us that, well, you cannot build on all of them. We said, all we are saying is to bring us all the land. Yeah. A map was created and we look into the map, a couple of things came out. If you drive on uh, Commercial Street, there is a building that was built there. That land came out of that. Uh, it's not a housing, I think it's a garage and then some office for veterans or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But then we found that we located that land from that map, but we know that we cannot build because of uh, the structure of the land. However, there were a couple of projects, actual projects that came out because of us asking for that map to be created. One was uh, uh, at the corner of Franklin and Middle Street. Uh, 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 there is a building that is going on. It's actually done. It was done by Chong, Community Housing of Maine, right? That land came out of that. And then the Douglas Street land, land also came out of that. And then there is a, a co-op housing that was built uh, that also came out of that land. I'm a big fan of looking at uh, uh, co-op housing because when you build more co-op housing, it should not be the only housing that we build for affordability. But if you are able to get pe people into co-op housing, what it does is that it helps people build equity. Whereby if they are renting, whether it is affordable housing or regular market housing, they don't build any equity. Um, uh, we have a... Uh, um, I'm sorry, do you like co-ops that have uh, affordability uh, covenants where yeah the, the equity is limited but it's, yes okay. yeah and then um, they um stay affordable yeah stay affordable yeah. and then when somebody have built into it when they get to a point where they can also take whatever equity they have built as individuals yeah. they can go and find uh somewhere to also buy their own small thing uh if that is what they want to do they can choose to stay there uh and then um kennedy park which is owned by portland housing authority uh a lot of people think portland housing authority is part of the city's arm of housing developer. Right. No, they are a quasi-governmental organization with their own policy and this thing. I will go into some sort of like a conversation with them and look and see, can we build high? I think uh, people are not happy when we build high in Portland that this is, this is not, but we're at a point where we don't have a choice. It is more expensive to take care of somebody who is not house than to put them in some sort of like a housing. Um, uh, so I will explore the possibilities of using a citizen uh, 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 a housing bond. How much, I don't know yet. I will have to talk to city staff because they are the experts on how much bond can we put out there and then work with people who are into development. Uh, but I will focus more with uh, uh, people like Portland Housing if they are open to building high here at Kennedy Park and in other parts of the city that they have uh, uh, properties. So how those would are that, how would that that work if you had a if you had a successful bond would the city be the developer would the city send out requests for proposals how, how would you uh, uh, engage I, I I don't want the city to be the developer even though there are models somewhere that have been successful in some European countries um, uh, uh, there is a block that I was asked to give a suggestion for a uh, podcast uh, uh, I don't have it off my 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 uh, how do you call it off of the, of my, head. on top yeah. of my head, yeah, yeah. there is a, a, a podcast that I, that I listened to, uh, or it's a book or something, some audio thing that I listened to. Somebody posted it online and then I went on to buy one. Then I listened to it on the first, I think, uh, municipal owned housing in Chicago. Um, I forgot what it's called, but, uh, uh it's an interesting convers uh, thing for me to learn where I am coming from. If I want to buy a house, uh, the American housing system still. It's an interesting thing to me. Yeah. In Ghana or in some parts of Africa, now they've also started doing mortgage. If you want to buy a house, you buy a land and you build your house. But then here, for hundreds of years, somebody will own a house and I will hear that it's still 
owe money on that property uh -huh. that they've built 30 years ago, right? Yeah. So I don't want the city to be a developer. I want the city to facilitate development, to create, give an opportunity for, uh, um, but the co-op model will be uh, like uh, uh, halfway from the city not being a developer and also uh, uh, not leaving uh, the housing market for individuals who will make money and put it in their pocket, right? By creating opportunities for people to build equity. So the way it will work is, theoretically, from where I'm sitting until I talk to experts, is that I hope that the city will look at, uh, will make RFP, people will respond and will look at the proposals in our front. Uh, and hopefully that will be because I am a firm believer or I have started believing in the co-op model, uh, that there will be some co-op and there will be some Avesta. I'm currently a tenant of Avesta. And then there will be some, uh, how do we call it, uh, some uh, Portland housing. Mm -hmm. Whoever will build more and put people into housing will be the one that, uh, that is the theory that I will give to city staff. And then they will use their expertise to craft something and bring it before the council and uh, the public sure. to discuss. So, um, uh, you know, one part of this conversation is uh, land use policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's an ongoing effort to uh, update the, the the city zoning, which is full of political uh, opposition in, on a neighborhood level, as you, you know, you mentioned earlier. And uh, I just wonder where you are on the whole recode project and uh, whether you think that's a, um, a viable way to, to expand our housing opportunities. I think it's one of many tools that we can use, one that being what I said, I, I think uh, 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 there's a saying that your, your, um, your budget is a reflection of your, um, your, your values as a city. And then your housing um, um, code um, also shows uh, the type of city that you want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, I'm not an expert in that, but uh, what I know from what I've learned so far is uh, uh, what you put in that code determines how your city is structured. I know that uh, there is uh, a lot of opposition on what can be put in what cannot be. And I think it goes back to what I said, that it's about time that Portland take a step back and ask ourselves, what type of city do we want to be? What type of community do we want to be? Do we want to have a community that is uh, 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 divided based on who does have and who doesn't have what, right? Do you want to have a community or a city where uh, the million dollar house will be sitting right next to a house that is $150,000. That's a question that not just me, uh, the city have to ask itself. And by the city, I'm talking about all of us, that what type of city do we want to be? Uh, how do we want to see Portland look like, as you asked, in the next 10 years? Yeah. Well, how do you have that conversation? Isn't that what the, the uh, mayoral race is about? Well, the mayoral race uh, uh, position is to put light on what we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And then once we find whoever the mayor is, uh, let's see how are they going to lead that conversation. If they don't, is there somebody on the council that will be able to take that leadership role so that we can have that conversation in the city? And as I, as I was saying, um, um, a, the way it is structured at a point, you have to let city staff take the lead because that is their role, right? And you as a, as a city councilor uh, or the mayor, yeah, you may be able to have a conversation with the manager one-on-one, uh, -on -one, but when this conversation is going on and it's in the public, unless there's a policy that you want to change, which is what we are doing now, staff in, is in the process of having this conversation and then they'll bring the final, uh, how do we call it, uh, the final uh, proposals to the council. And then the council can also look at it. As a counselor, are you engaged in that process? I currently, um, this morning I had a conversation on Zoom with a group of people called Portland Voices. And I said to them that I'm a very strong process oriented. Uh, we have intricates, we have lines that have been put by our charter. So when there's an issue that is going to come to the council and it is, to, uh, it is at a committee or a city level, I try as much as I can. It doesn't matter how much I care about that to stay away from it and let them do their work. Um, and then once it gets to me, of course, the, 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 the city is not, uh, city staff are not going to put it in my table today and say that you have to make a decision today. They give me, there's a grace period where they will bring you to me. And when they are doing, they will give us update on this is where we are and then say to us that in about a month you're going to have, then I will look into it deep mm -hmm. and I will talk to people that I consider to be experts 
like I said, you cannot be expert in everything. <laughs> and then sick people in the community, both those that I will agree with and those that I may not agree with based on the way they look at things, have a conversation with them before I go to my decision making. And then I will make recommendations or give feedback to city staff on what I think uh, needs to happen. Yeah. So uh, his, <clears throat> excuse me, historically, one of the ways that uh, affordable housing was created was um, small units in densely uh, populated neighborhoods uh, where people could walk. You didn't need to have a car. Everybody didn't need to have a car. Um, uh, their services, stores, and other you know employers are all within walking distance of the housing. Uh, the irony of Portland is the neighborhoods that look like that have become uh, upper income neighborhoods uh, mm -hmm. because they're so desirable. Um, but the uh, uh, land use policy doesn't let you replicate that in other areas. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm wondering, in terms of uh, you know, when you think about affordability, uh, do you think about that kind of walkability and different kinds of transportation, how that affects um, uh, people's ability to uh, afford? To housing? afford that. I think uh, uh, you, you, gentrification happens, uh, whether we pay close attention or not, and it will happen uh, in so many ways, right? Yeah. That walkability, I know that um, a, a you said that in Portland, it is not uh, easy to do that, right? Uh, to replicate it somewhere else in Portland. Yeah. Uh, but there is a, this movement is called, is it called small town or something? Uh, there are neighborhood stay, the, uh, there is this neighborhood um, idea where in each neighborhood, they try to have restaurants, they're trying to have uh, small shops, uh, they're trying to have, uh, what we need to look at is in those neighborhoods, are we going to let neighborhoods stay the way they look or are we going to have a conversation on that is what i mean by let's look at ourselves as the city of portland and say how do we want to look like who do we want to live where right so i don't want to mention any neighborhood right yeah. but let's say neighborhood a uh, only have a lot of uh, 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 single family house, homes right but then they build shops small shops typical of uh, portland or new england um, uh, uh, towns, small shops, uh, pizza shop is here, there's a salon here that has the hair and baba, there's a cobbler somewhere in the corner, uh, nice restaurants. Uh, are we going to say that we're going to let it be the way it is? Or are we going to have a conversation and look ourselves and say that, well, uh, we need to put a certain type of house in here? Because it, it, we tend to say we are a welcoming city, right? Portland is welcoming, which is true. But we are also naturally not by anybody's fault. I don't think nobody sit down and design that this is how it's going to be. Yes, policies are put in place that have us segregated, right? If you look closely, um, each each neighborhood that you have a public housing on the side or affordable on the side, uh, at the sphere of it, or at a very distant with uh, the way it is done, um, there's no highway that says that, oh no, this part is all, there's no line that is visible, but we are. Right. So how do we find a way through this process of recording or creating neighborhoods? Uh, how do we have a conversation on what is possible in Portland? Um, you know, something uh, you talk about welcoming everyone and we have people across the economic spectrum coming to Portland every day from uh, very wealthy to uh, very poor. And uh, how do you how do you welcome new people uh, without growth? We haven't really grown in, in the last two censuses. The, 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 the total population of the city, city stays the same, even though we can see with our eyes that new people are coming all the time. How do we, uh, how do we accommodate uh, new people and, and how big do you think the city could get, should get? Are you happy with it in its current size? Do you think it should be bigger? I, I think uh, it goes back to the housing, the, the policies that we have in the books, yeah. right? Uh, I read somewhere that in the 20s, Portland was like a hundred and something thousand people. Uh, when I was talking to someone, he said, well, in those days, they ha they're having more kids. Right. And I said, yeah, but the kids live in a house, right? They live somewhere. Uh, uh, why can't we do that now, right? Uh, it's because of some of the policies that we have in the books on yeah. where you can build and how you can build. We need to take a very deep and very uncomfortable conversation 
on uh, 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 where do we build and what do we build somewhere. Of course, this is a beautiful home. I'm not, this is a beautiful structure. It's a beautiful house. This is a very historical, beautiful house. I'm not going to say that. Let's tear this down and put something up. But in places that we can, we should have that difficult conversation. Or do we want to put this here? If not, why? If yes, why? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's go on to another very difficult and uh, related issue, um, uh, the encampments. Um, uh, I, I saw tents this morning. I'm sure you probably have seen, you see them every day. I do. Um, something appears to be uh, different. Uh, we've had, you know, growing level of homelessness for, for a number of years, but it seems to have reached a crisis point. Um, and uh, whatever it is that we've been doing uh, doesn't appear to be working. So what what is your approach to uh, to the problem of homelessness as it is uh, in uh, becomes obvious or it manifests itself through these encampments um, currently I think tonight the city is going uh, we're going to have a workshop uh, with city staff and they're going to bring us uh, uh, recommendations uh, best practices but if you ask me um, I think we're having um, a homeless crisis um, all over yours. We're also having an issue of mental health and not just a lightly mental, but extreme mental health issues mm -hmm. uh, all over the country. I was in DC about a month ago and not far from White House, there were a lot of tents. Um, um, uh, people were sleeping in tents and I look at it and I say, oh my goodness, this is the most wealthiest country in the world. How is this happening, right? Uh, perhaps you or someone who will be watching this knows that a couple of years ago, I'm using a couple loosely that people who were in mental health institutions were let go. And there are laws in place that say that you cannot force anybody to take medication unless they want to, unless they are harmful to themselves or to others. I used to work with an organization um, that housed uh, uh, individuals who have that. Before you get into the program, you have to have committed a crime or you have to have done something that hurt someone and then the judge send you to jail and then the organization that I work with will go to jail and interview you and bring you into the program. And in that program, we have something that we call, it's like a wraparound, where each individual have a staff member that work with them. But we also work with their service providers, their psychiatrists, uh, uh, a family member if they have one and everything. And once a month or once in a while, uh, it's a monthly or quarterly, they have like a, a team meeting with this person in the middle. Each one giving them their feedback. Oh, now you do, your, you do your laundry on time. You do this, you do this. So what we do is help support this person and walk them through until they are ready to go back into society. Uh, the recidivism rate for these individuals that go is very small. Once in a while, there will be somebody that will let go and then about a month you see them back again. They went out and started using or something happened to them and they got in trouble and then they come back, right? So uh, I think we need to look at I categorize the individuals that we have who are on house and intend mm -hmm. uh, the encampments and not into three, three groups. There's a one group who are people that have had luck in life. I have worked with uh, uh, Oswald Street Shelter before when I moved here. And uh, when you do intake, somebody will say, um, I was late on child support. So even though I have a job, uh, I can't afford to leave because my child support is being taken. There's somebody that will say that um, my house was on fire. I lose everything, I didn't have insurance. And there are some people that are hardcore, uh, 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 your regular person who has been uh, on house for several years to the extent that even if you give them an apartment, they're going to be there for uh, maybe three months and then they will violate all of their um, rental agreement and they will back on the street. Yeah. Uh, and then you have the ones that I mentioned earlier, that is the third group. The group that it is difficult because uh, they've gone beyond the basic support that you can give them they are at a point where they need to be institutionalized not institutionalized like, like jail or something like that they need a facility where a wrap around service is provided so that uh they get the support that they need they may or may not go back to be uh fully productive members of society they may need support throughout their lives sure so the question now is how do we find is it at the state level or is it at the federal level or is that a municipal level that we find support for this i believe that at say how do we call it uh, at, the, at the municipal level we can do the first one where we have affordable housing 
for those that are in the first group. The second group is, uh, I think, uh, uh, the state legislature may have passed the uh, housing first model. The second group will fit perfectly into those that will benefit from housing, housing first model mm -hmm. or some other programs. And then the third group, we need to have also uh, look and see what is possible, but it's going to be difficult. I mean, housing first is not a new idea, uh, and we have uh, very good examples locally of, yeah. of it working. Mm -hmm. uh, Logan Place. Mm -hmm. uh, the the stumbling block is always money. Yes. And uh, who's going to provide the services, and uh, that is going to always be a challenge on a municipal level. I just wondered, like, where where does the the the, the local uh, municipal responsibility um, uh, begin and end? How much can we do? Yeah. So that is why I say that the first one, which is just people that you need to put into affordable emergency, housing, emergency, emergency issues, emergency yeah, issues yeah. and that one is easy, yeah. we can do it, we can build more. It comes back to that policy around housing and where do we put our money, right? Yeah. The second one is the housing first, which uh, also needs money. So yeah. in Portland, we need to talk to the state. Maybe tonight when we have that conversation, the, uh, the governor just uh, uh, created the Office of New Americans. I think there's something about housing, but I hope and wish that uh, at the state level, uh, the governor and the state legislature will look at what can be done for that. I think they just passed the housing first, but can we put in more money so that uh, we'll have more of it? Because obviously what we are seeing on the streets in Portland, and I'm sure that soon in some other parts of the state, I, I, I read somewhere that I think it's Bangor or something is going to pass a policy to look at encampment. So the encampment is not just happening here. Yeah. But how can we, how can we, how much do we need to put into place to do more of the, uh, the housing first, give some support to the individuals who are giving services like Purple Street and other organizations, um, 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 both here in Poland and across the state. How much money do we need to give them and find the money from somewhere? Uh-huh. And you don't know what that number is. I don't know what that number yeah, is. Yeah. Uh, maybe tonight we may have that but, number. Uh, but you've been on the council for a while, so you you know what the what the limitations are, right? Yeah. I mean, why why do you think we haven't have been more aggressive in terms of housing first uh, for those chronically homeless people who um, are burdening the the uh, emergency system? I think it's about funding. Uh, um, currently, the speaker, uh, Richard Talbot Ross, I think, uh, moved forward a bill that have created a, a, a part of money that will fund uh, housing first across the street. I think uh, the state can be more aggressive than what we do. we're doing. We've done great by putting, starting to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I think the state should look at, uh, that should definitely be the responsible of the state instead of uh, municipalities, because as we have all, we all agree, or we both agree, that uh, um, the, the, the municipal uh, uh, resources are limited uh, because we shoulder a lot of things. And so um, they, the state need to, uh, to do more, more than what we are doing as a state. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's go to a, a somewhat related problem uh, to what we've already been talking about, but the asylum seekers. Right. Uh, this is a destination uh, among many other cities in the country, we're mm -hmm. not the only one. So that people get the impression that uh, Portland is the only place that that um, asylum seekers yeah. are coming to. Uh, but clearly, is it's a failure in federal policy um, uh, to deal with immigration in a rational way, and uh, there are has created uh, these bottlenecks uh, for people who are trying to get here. And um, how do we? Um, welcome and accommodate uh, people who are coming here who don't have uh, the ability to work, uh, who have great um, uh, legal needs, uh, you know, a very complicated, have to navigate a very complicated legal pro process. What What is the city's role here? Um, the, city's, the city's role, and I'm glad that uh, the governor have created the Office of uh, uh, New Americans. Mm -hmm. What that will do is that it will lift some of the a burdens that is, I, I don't want to call it burden, uh, it will bring in much more resources. Uh, uh, I don't know how that will look like, but what are the responsibilities of the city is uh, uh, what we are already doing. Um, we cannot do more than what we are doing currently, which is we welcome people, we provide uh, support for them to find housing, uh, uh, provide food, work with uh, uh, 
community partners, organizations that are already doing the work, give them the support that they need uh, to welcome people and uh, house people and uh, um, churches, faith groups uh, who are also stepping in into the picture to provide some sort of like uh, resources that uh, uh, Portland is already doing doing an amazing job, uh, like many other towns and both small and big across the country. Uh, municipal governments are doing or municipal uh, municipalities are doing as much as they can. I think uh, at federal level, uh, we 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 need to continue to pressurize uh, Congress and the president so that uh, the issue of our work authorization is the number of uh, months that they have to wait is lowered. I have a parent uh, uh, through my daytime job that I've worked with. These parents have been part of my parent group since I started this group uh, 12 years, right? Uh, he called me about um, a month ago and he was crying. And then he said, thank you for everything. I said, uh, what's going on? Yeah. He was literally crying. He said, today my asylum was approved. Ah, right. 12 years. 12 years. He bought a house in Biddeford. Uh, he doesn't live in Portland anymore. He currently serves on the board of my organization. He bought a house in Biddeford. He had worked as a swim coach. His background is in uh, accounting. When he was back home uh, from where he came from, um, he was uh, uh, um, an accountant for huge international nonprofit. He does evaluation. Uh, he always joked with me, I'm going to evaluate your work. And then I'll say, that is what you love how to do. You feel free <laughs> to evaluate my work. Yeah. So uh, it, it, I think we also need the public um, uh, need to look at these individuals as assets instead of what we are looking at them. The city of Portland alone have about 200 and something vacancies, right? Uh, some of the, the things that we do, I know somebody who can do that job, but because of the uh, limitations of the, um, uh, um, uh, whether they can work or not, they cannot. And then municipal governments are spending money on them. Um, and it takes a long time for them to be able to even start working. I, uh, <clears throat> I, think, uh, I think it's a, 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 a Representative Pingree and uh, a, uh, Senator Collins have a bill that I think if it's able to pass will be helpful to uh, cities like Portland that is desirable for asylum seekers. Um, so that the number of months that they have to wait uh, will be lowered and then they can work as they are waiting for whether it is 10 or 12 years. Uh, my, my friend, the one whose story I shared, uh, have been in Maine for 12 years. Uh, I think um, the first three or four years, he didn't even have a, I remember every time he would come back to me, he said, I went to the immigration court in Boston. They denied it or they said, I should bring this paper. Eventually, he got uh, his work authorization. Um, 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 it was not approved. He has to go through several times. I have written several letters through his lawyers to support him and, and, and share the type of leader that he is in the community. The some of the good work that he's doing with kids and parents and, 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 and then eventually he got it back. Before the 12 years, he bought a house. Uh, uh, three of his kids went through college. He paid for some of them out of pocket. Right. Uh, so that is the type of people that we have here. We have to start looking at them as assets who are bringing in skills and who are going to fill in uh, some of the vacancies that we have in uh, in in our how do we call it uh, in businesses and offices, uh, both government, uh, nonprofit, and the public sector, private sector. Yeah. Yeah, and and on the municipal level, do you think there's not much more that we can do? Uh, apart from supporting them, I think uh, uh, we can galvanize uh, uh, our city to write letters to Congress when there's a bill. I think the Chamber of Commerce, the business community can also play a role, uh, not in terms of giving money, but in terms of pressuring uh, pressuring uh, Congress to pass. Uh, there is some group that I'm part of. It is uh, immigrants like me who are in first generation immigrants like me who yeah. are in elected office. Um, hardly a month passes without some letter coming that tell Congress to do this. And then I just now I don't even say I just put my name. There. <laughs> um, there was one that came that I saw the uh, the National uh, um, uh, Chamber of Commerce. When I saw their name, I said, "Oh, this is good because this will speak to the congressmen and congresswomen that uh, this is not just about immigrants asking you." to uh, uh, change a policy to benefit immigrants. But this is the business community saying that we are the engines of this country uh, 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 and we, we need this because these people are bringing in um, a lot of things that will help us. Uh, I want to shift gears again. Um, 
uh, a lot of the agenda for the city's government has been set by the referendum process, not by the deliberative process of the city council. Um, and I'm wondering if you uh, think that's a good way um, to to bring issues forward. Um, is that a, uh, is this how the city is supposed to function, or is it a, a sign that the city's not functioning the way it should? Uh, what, what's your your take on referendums? Right, uh, referendums have become uh, quite popular recently, the past few years. Yeah. But it also happened to be at a time that uh, a, the city of Portland is facing a lot of challenges. There was the pandemic. There was the George Floyd. There's all sort of things being thrown at us. And uh, a sector of the community believe that uh, we are not being fast enough on issues that they believe is uh, uh, is uh, impacting the larger community, right? Um, uh, I think referendums have a place in our political uh, uh, process. What I don't uh, think I am there yet is I think what we have currently in the books, which is five years before it can be touched by the council, uh, unless someone put another referendum in the uh, on the ballot, uh, that is where I personally am having a, a, a difficulty with. We recently tried to amend the chapter nine uh, uh, and put it on the ballot for the public to vote on, and uh, myself, uh, Councillor Rodriguez, and the mayor have wanted three years uh, 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 because it's five years now, but we were uh, um, outvoted, and so it is staying the way it is. I hope that. In the future, a future council will have a very meaningful discussion on how is this impacting uh, some of the um, uh, process that we have in place, and how how do uh, how do we call it uh, uh, policies that have been passed through these? How is it working? Um, there is an issue about uh, things the Green New Deal, where a certain part of the a city. Uh, the, the the community are saying that because of the Green New Deal, we cannot build in Portland. And the certain partners are, no, that is not true. Actually, it's making building easy. I chair the housing committee. I've asked city staff that, um, which is it? And city staff have said to me that uh, it's too soon. We don't have data to prove whether it is this or that. Right. right? But I believe that three years is enough time to look at data and then decide on, is this a policy that we want to keep? Or is it a policy that we want to make better? Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, something that have been put on in, 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 in the books by citizens to be just thrown out unless it is causing a lot of damage and uh, uh, to the larger community, then yes, let's get that. The council has the ability to um, propose changes that you send out to the voters. Um, yes, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, in, in light, you know, in, in spite of all the referendums that have passed, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, to a great deal of criticism from City Hall, yeah, um, but we haven't seen the council say, well, "This is how we can make rent control uh, work better," or "This is how we could um, uh, make one of the, uh, you know, the the building standards, the Green New Deal, um, better." And is it just because it is unclear um, about whether they are working or wh wh why haven't we seen that? Oh, you mean the council have not touched it, take it after it's been passed? The, after it's been passed, the council could um, send changes back out to the voters. Uh, yes, I, I think uh, I did ask, uh, it may be uh, the city manager, uh, because she was previously the corporation council, uh, just before we took a vote recently. And now uh, what I was told was that uh, historically it's never been done. Mm -hmm. And I think um, um, we're following tradition, so <laughs> we, we're trying to let it be. I, I don't think there's any uh, good reason why it is not. For me, as I said, uh, if it is something uh, that citizens have put in place and it's been passed, I will reluctantly uh, take it. Uh, what I think I can do is continue having the conversation of uh, moving it from five years to three years. Because uh, it doesn't matter what the policy is, uh, every policy is double-edged. Right, there are policies that will do good work, and there are policies that you agree with but will not be good. Mm -hmm. Right, so or there are policies that you don't agree with, and then it goes to the citizens based on the way it is worded, and then it passes. Mm -hmm. Then you have to, you, even though you don't agree with it, you have to live with it for five years, or you have to go out and galvanize people, take another, collect signatures, uh, and then put a counter this thing, which we've seen happen. And any time yeah. that happens, it creates more division in 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 the city. So I think the three year limitation will make it much easier. Would you? Can you do that without changing the charter? 
Yes, you just have to put it on the ballot. Put it on the ballot. The council, the councillors will say, we want to make changes to three, the chapter nine to three years, okay. and then you send it to voters. And if voters approve it, then it's law. So one issue that's been um, up for a referendum vote multiple times is short-term rentals. And um, uh, sometimes the, uh, you know, the advocates will put out an, uh, an issue uh, and our question, and the, uh, the landlords will put out an opposing question. And, um, but we haven't really um, heard from the council what the best uh, policy is. And I, I guess um, that's my question for you is, what do you think of the state of regulation of short-term rentals now? Um, do you think it's a problem uh, in terms of housing availability? And um, is there anything the city could or should be doing to, uh, uh, to address it? I, what I believe uh, or what I think we could do is uh, uh, he pass a policy that says uh, that uh, short-term rentals should only be done by people who uh, own or occupy, whatever it's called. I am a firm believer of that. However, uh, there's been times that I have publicly said that this is going to be uh, one of the things that I want to see happen, right? Uh, uh, but a survey of my police on the council shows uh, that uh, there's no enough support for that. And um, as I said earlier, uh, my leadership is not in a way that uh, you bring things forward uh, so as to make uh, some, we're not Congress. Uh, this is right. Portland, Portland, Maine. You don't uh, make your colleagues look that bad because they don't agree to do something, right? Yeah. I, I will let people, when it happened to be in front of them, um, or you, you, when they are questioned like the way you question me, um, 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 I will let them answer it that way, but I will not bring something that will be. Uh, that that will be i think the council is healing from previous uh contentious many councils and i've sat i know how it is like to be in a council that is very contentious it makes the work very difficult so i think at a point the council will have to look and see uh revisit the policies that we have uh if i'm the mayor i will definitely um uh, talk to my colleagues and see if we can take that and look and see if we can and, and what will you say to them well, what what is the what is the case that you would make? Yeah, I will I will say that uh, uh, I have when we canvass we hear it. People will say that uh, this house and that house are all uh, are all have been purchased by. Uh, there's a street that somebody said to me that uh, this neighborhood have uh, X number of houses by X number because we know every time there are different people coming in and they were purchased by people from out of state. So I will give them that example. If possible, I will say, go to this neighborhood and talk to the people who live there. Because when you are talking, you are sitting down and having a conversation. Uh, there was a time that I only said it on during council meeting that I would look into Airbnb. And I have like uh, tons of email and phone calls from people who operate Airbnb. Most of them are saying that this is my lifelong savings. Um, uh, uh, and this and this and this. And also it is only a tiny minor. If you want more housing, just build it right uh which to some extent is true but i also want to look into it and see that uh, i mean um um um, um wait, what can we do there to reduce some of the impact the negative adverse impact that airbnb is having and i think by making it only as uh, um, owner occupied um, uh, uh, are we able to reduce that currently if you rent an apartment from me a two or three bedroom apartment you are able to, if I agree, you are able to rent living one and rent the yeah. two. So all of those need to change. And uh, uh, yeah, I hope that the council is going to change again. I hope that uh, either way I'm going to be there, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope that the next council will, will be open to having this conversation. Yeah. Uh, here's a completely unrelated question. Um, uh, there's talk about consolidating the high schools and somebody who has served on the school committee and spent a lot of time in the community. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Should, uh, can Portland continue with three high schools? And if not, uh, where should the uh, yep. high school be? I have, I have been part of a committee that was put together by the former uh, uh, superintendent and the uh, current school board uh, member, uh, Ben Grant, was on that committee with me. I think we were the coaches or there were some coaches and uh -huh. we were just uh, part of that. And we there was a research that was done. It took like a year and then the result that we got back was that, um, oh, uh, you just have to adjust the way classes are filled and there was some technicalities on why you cannot have uh, 
you should continue to have the three high schools. I also know that uh, schools like Portland High is a school that have a lot of history. Uh, 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 and uh, do I think we need one high school? I think we need a comprehensive high school in Portland. Um, a few years ago, I reached out to the state. I talked to uh, Hannah Pingree about uh, 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 having um, support from the uh, state to have like a, because her office is the office of the future or something. Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I love the trades. Um, uh, Portland Technology High School, uh, when I was on the school board, I used to visit there. Um, I currently have a relationship with them. I go there once in a while. Anytime they have an event, they invite me, I do go. Um, I have a lot of people in, uh, uh, um, anytime I'm conversing, I've met people that are into building, then they said, listen, um, the kids these days, you give them a hammer, they don't even know how to nail a, a, a nail, right? Yeah. Hammer and nail. And I, I, and I wish we have a comprehensive high school uh, that have your traditional high school, that have uh, uh, some sort of like uh, um, uh, um, um, student center learning, like Kim Middle School or Casco Bay, and also that have uh, something like a uh, uh, Portland Technology um, High School in it, in in one building. In one yeah, location. where uh, students yeah. with different type of learning will have what is it that they need, but it costs money. So uh, uh, still, we also need to look at that and say, what does Portland need? Uh -huh. uh, and have a, a very strong uh, emotionless conversation. We, we leave our emotions out and have an honest conversation with ourselves. Do we really need um, uh, three high schools or do we need one uh, beautiful, comprehensive high school with all these amenities in them for our kids? Because uh, they are the future of our city um, and uh, uh, we need to provide them with what they make them good, good, good members of our community. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a ranked choice election. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that when you go to the voting booth, you're going to put yourself as number one. <laughs> uh, who do you put as two? I am still thinking. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 know, I know very well two of my colleagues. Uh, what I don't know is uh, uh, three of the individuals who are running. The fourth person, I have met with him once. Uh, as we are having this conversation, um, 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 I will pay close attention on who is saying what and how they are saying it. Because if I am not the mayor, whoever is the mayor, I want a mayor that sees the, the role uh, uh, um, the uh, same as I do. Mm -hmm. So all friendship aside, all having worked with someone for three years, I've known someone forever. Uh, uh, I'm going to pay close attention on how uh, my, I don't want to use the company word competition because uh, we all care about Portland and we are trying to be the ones that will lead the city into the place that we believe. So my co-runners, I will pay close attention on how they uh, they see the role uh, uh, and then I will decide on who will be my number two and who I will tell my uh, people that ask me. And, uh, nobody has started asking me yet. Uh, uh, so for now, I'm just cheering for myself. Like, yeah, vote for me. Yeah. But as we as as the this um, process go through, I think I will learn somewhere. Okay. And uh, the final question for me is, um, you, why are you running for mayor, and why should we vote for you? Well, I think I've been on the council for so many years. I've served on the school board for three years. Uh, there is a core working relationship between the, those two bodies. Um, uh, I've worked with both of them, um, I, and I think I've done that well. And I also think that there is, uh, uh, I've sat through, if you add my uh, school board this thing, I've worked with uh, all these mayors, uh, not just me, there are other, be competitors, uh, there are other people who are also running in the race. Uh, but I think what is more important is uh, um, we need, uh, uh, this time in Portland, we need uh, a leader uh, who knows how to bring people together just like what I described earlier, uh, my view and my vision uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the role of the mayor is what we need now more than ever. Um, our city has seen different kind of mayors the past three years. Uh, we face different challenges. We need a mayor that will be able to be uh, a consensus builder. We need a mayor that will be able to work closely with the public, the uh, uh, staff, and the council. And I believe that I am that mayor, so please uh, vote for me. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, Pastor. I hope we don't cut that part out. <laughs>
uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming in and, and no, thank, thank you, you for, for putting yourself out. And uh, you thank you for having me. It's yeah. it's an honor. I jokingly said to someone uh, yesterday that uh, when I left Ghana, I was coming to flick burgers in the US. <laughs> and here I am. My name is uh, on the ballot in the largest city in the state of Maine. Uh, so uh, it's been a big honor for me uh, to take this journey and to come to this uh, uh, place where I am right now. Um, I'm honored, and I think it's a privilege that I don't take lightly. So, Very thank good. you. Thank you. You're welcome.